Star Baby, welcome back to 10th Century. It's good to see you again. Sunny where you are? It is. It's sunny and hot. Oh, Bef you're referring to the glasses. Yeah, so it turns out that my father-in-law, who has long left us, used to have these 1970 Ray-Bans, and my wife found them and gifted them to me. And I thought I could open this by looking more or less like a 1970s porn star or a naval aviator, whichever. They're close. Hi, why don't you give your intro now? So I will do my intro. So hey, hey, um, just I'll talk to the audience directly, first of all, um, because normally I would record separately an intro to a video that already has an intro. And frankly, I'm a bit bored of doing that. It takes some time. And the more efficient I can make this process, the better. So I'm just going to say the normal thing, which is that this channel is free and there's no advertising on it. So, and Starbaby is certainly not making any money out of it. That's prohibited by his uh, employment contract with his employer. Um, and he wouldn't do it anyway because that's not the kind of person he is. And I'm not that kind of person either. So it's all free. We're doing this from the goodness of our hearts. Um, and in return, all we would ask is that you like it. And if you think it's good, that is. Don't like it if you think it's shit. Tell us. Um that you share it with other people who are like-minded and who might be interested in it. And that if you think that this sort of content is something that you enjoy more of, then subscribe to the channel and hit that bell notification button so you get an, a message when we release a new video or I release a new video. Because even though it looks like this has become the Stephen Starbaby channel, uh, <laughs> that is that is not the intention. Um, but uh, it's just how it's working out at the moment. In fact, I was supposed to interview somebody else today, but they had a, an issue. Um, so I moved it to next week. So there will be another guest on next week. Um, unbelievably, Star Baby will have a, a week or so to recover until we have him on again. Anyway, good to see you again. Thank uh, you it's for, good for to see you us. too. And remind you that I'm going to be on again for a live event in eight days. In eight, oh, it is eight anything. days, isn't it? Yes. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. So, and also, if you like, if you like this uh, this short episode, which uh, hopefully it will be, it won't be too long. Um, come along to the live event. Um, that's actually a serious point. So what we're doing today is something a bit different. Um, there was a video that came out from the Ukrainian Air Force a couple of days ago, a minute 40, we're going to play it, and then I'm going to ask Star Baby for some commentary on it. Uh, but that video uh, shows uh, MiG-29 firing AGM-88 harms, which is something we've been aware of as uh, the general public uh, in terms of open source intelligence for for a week or two. Uh, but it's the first time we've actually seen video of it from a, the Ukrainian point of view. So I'm going to get Star Baby's um, input on that. It's interesting to see some of the uh, messages or... Uh, some of the other videos, the responses that have come online, including one by an F-14 Rio who uh, entitled his video Kill Shots, hopefully we'll be providing a, a bit more of an erudite and informed view, given that Star Baby has fired many harms in his lifetime and knows all about those systems. <laughs> he does. I, mean, I know technically you haven't fired them, but you know, that's that's by the by. For, for most people, it's, it's good enough that you were the person who said, hit the pickle button. Fair enough. So anyway, I'm rambling now. This is what you've done to me. Um, so if you think this is good, then join us for that. So this conversation is not supposed to be about uh, Russian air power and its application in the special operation um, over the Ukraine. This is supposed to be in response to that video. So it's a little different from what we would normally do or what I would normally do on the channel. With that said, shall I pull up the video and play it? Pull up the video and play it. Okay. Ми хочемо мирне небо і зберегти життя дітей, не розбиті міста і села, а щасливі посмішки людей. Це наш рідний край, тут наші батько і мати, скажу ворогу бомбай, зможемо все подолати. Люди не втрачайте віри. За свободу боремо щодня У нас крові не здаватись І ти вперед, і ти до кінця Наша нація не зламна Не дамо тут панувати Буде 
жити Україна Будем землю захищати Люди не втрачайте віри Ми переможці з України Люди не втрачайте віри Ми герої своєї країни Люди не втрачайте віри Ми переможці з України Люди не втрачайте віри Ми герої своєї країни so, um, obviously, the video, as you see at the end, is a dedication to uh, Yevgen Lysenko, I think his name is. It was somebody, uh, presumably another MiG-29 pilot who was killed earlier in the campaign. So uh, that's a nice tribute to him. But Starbaby, from a uh, sort of an open source intelligence point of view, what do you make of that video generally before we delve into um, some of the specifics? Okay, so I'll give you a couple of things. But first, I want to point out that uh, uh, that it was to memorialize uh, Major Lysenko. He was a MiG-29 pilot in Ukraine. He was killed on or around March 9th uh, and fell his, with his aircraft into Ukrainian territory. The way the story's been published online, and I found no contradictions but also no confirmation, is that he took on two Russian fighters of unspecified type in a 2v1, he bagged one and then was killed by a Russian air defense battery. So that's as much as I can get out of that story. Uh, and I just want to make sure we open with the purpose of that video, which was for uh, uh, a fighter pilot whose tradition probably does not involve burning pianos uh, to mo- memorialize one of his bros. So having said that, um, Let's talk about a couple of big picture things. One is obviously you are seeing a MiG-29 firing and shooting harms. You are also seeing a MiG-29 that is still carrying its heat seeking AA-11 Archer missiles under the wings. Um, you see a gunshot, 30 millimeter gunshot, which is kind of neat. Um, you see a couple of unguided rocket shots. Uh, which is also kind of neat. But all of that highlights the fact that the MiG-29 is not a real air-to-ground fighter. It's an air-to-air fighter, and the original MiG-29s had a very limited ordnance selection, and it was dumb bombs and rockets. As near as I can tell, and I've looked at cockpit pictures of the Polish modifications and the Czech uh, modifications and the German modifications... This looks to me like an unwesternized MiG-29. Um, it could, and it's most likely Ukrainian because as much talk as there has been about transferring MiG-29s, I don't know if any airframes have yet been transferred. I can't find an actual confirmation one way or another. Parts certainly have been, uh, and equipment has been, but those look like unmodified or slightly upgraded MiG-29s, um, which means that there was no easy shortcut to integrate the harm onto this because somebody had put a 1760 data bus on the airplane. Uh, so it took some thought uh, and some hard work uh, to put that into play. So that's kind of the big picture from the video. Uh, you see a couple of harm shots. Those are definitely harms. We've seen pictures that the Russians have put on social media uh, claiming that those are AGM-88Bs. sorry, AGM 88Bs. Uh, an AGM 88B can be loaded with block two software or block three software. And software is a very broad term. In this case, this has a double EEPROM. This is an electrically erasable, reprogrammable, read only memory. Okay, so this is 1980s technology at best. And essentially, you erase the software load, put in a new software load. So an AGM-88B can have a block two or three software. I don't think it makes a difference in this case. And frankly, um, depending on how dense the emitter environment is, I might want block two software. Can you expand on that? then? So, so one thing we should say quickly, well, one thing that's on my mind, and I know one thing that's definitely on, a different thing maybe that's definitely on your mind. So the first is that, I, I don't really want to be responsible for doing work for the Russians, so we, we we don't want to be telling them things they probably couldn't figure out themselves, right? But the second thing is, as you've said to me previously offline, um, you know, harm targeting system and and harm uh, are active weapon systems used by the U.S. Air Force and and their allies. So so there are limits on what can be said. But with those two caveats in place, what what is the difference between those two block blocks of software, and why would they the threat emitter density matter? 
Um, it's not so much that the threat emi it, yeah, threat emitter density uh, matters. There's minor differences between the block two and three, but the block three is the improved software. Uh, and unless I had some special cases, I which I'm not going to go into, I really wouldn't want to use it precisely for the reason you're alluding to is parts of those missiles are going to fall into enemy hands. Uh, and I don't want any portion of it being extractable. I'd rather have the older software load and hold back whatever tricks uh, might be resident in the improved software. So, so what can we infer then respecting your desire not to or your your um, statement that you will not? You know, go into some specifics. What can we infer about that then? Uh, about your statement that it's a 1980s type technology missile? Does that mean it's good? Does that mean it's not very good? What does it mean? Oh man, the harm sweet. Uh, like the uh, like the APR 47 on the F4G, a vastly superior electronic warfare system. Uh, the the missile manages to get really good performance out of what is relatively old technology. And what's not uh, old technology is not bad. If it works, it works. And it might be slower and it might be harder to program. Uh, but the fact that the missile had a software reprogrammability function allows it to have flexibility that early anti-radiation missiles don't have. And that, Soviet-built anti-radiation missiles probably do not have. So that that is a huge advantage because, I mean, I talk about Block 2 and Block 3 software. We could have loaded those missiles with a Block U software that was tailored to Ukrainian needs and doesn't necessarily have all the extra kind of capabilities that might creep in when you're designing it for a worldwide threat, right? Because when you load the harm up with a software load, Initially, you don't necessarily know where that's going to be used. And reprogramming the software on a block level is a maintenance function, not an aircrew function. Okay, you know, loading the sending the handoff word to the harm, uh, you know, the aircrew does that through the avionics. Uh, but the actual pr base program is a maintenance function when the missiles are, are reloaded. So, so one thing I've noticed, a small number of voices, but uh, I noticed it was there, there was some suggestion that, that uh, the US was really sort of throwing the Ukraine's a bone by, you know, saying here's some old AGM-88s. And it sounds like actually that's a serious capability. Um, and the question then becomes, uh, you know, is it being used the right way to make it effective, I suppose? Yeah, it does. I, I, I They got a good weapon. Um you know, and having all having a later model harm that the aircraft doesn't have the AV onyx to exploit doesn't do them any good. Right? It's not that newer is necessarily better if the older stuff is enough. And I think an AGM eighty eight B is enough with Block Two software uh, to kill radars demonstrably because the U.S. has killed radars with AGM eighty eight Bs before. Russian built radars. I, you know, don't hesitate to point out. <laughs> So what can we infer from it? So I'm going to start technical and then move into tactical. On the technical side, and somebody else pointed this out, but showed that when the weapon was fired, the aircraft thinks it's an R-27, which is the AA-10 Alamo, if you're into uh, NATO designations. So normally a MiG-29 on air defense mission carries two R-27s, one on each side. One's a radar, one, in, one is infrared. Uh, that would be a, a, a standard loadout. Of course, they can load them up any way they, they feel they need to. And the weapon system clearly believes that it is firing R-27s. Okay? That's good. Okay? That is a cheap way to do your integration because you are hijacking existing code in the weapon system. All you need, really, is a fire pulse. And... Uh, you need the aircraft to recognize it as a weapon so that all the master arm interlocks and the safety interlocks and everything works. They've clearly done that. Now, I have to point out that that this can be done with a plug. So these are not connected by your, you know, RS-232 or whatever else kind of cable you might want to connect it with. This is what's called a cannon plug. 
which is a round plug. If you look at a military radio, you look at this uh, older one, you'll see all these little round plugs with screw caps. And they have all these little pins. And each of those pins has a little function, and it does a different thing based on whether the pin sees voltage. Anybody that's programmed an Arduino to you know do your basic robotics class, you have your pin in, your pin out, your 3 volt, your 5 volt. That's exactly the same thing with the cannon plug. So one of the ways that you had to deal with training ordinance in the bad old days was you had to use SIM plugs. Today, if I want simulated ordinance on the F-15E, I put it in the SIM mode. If I want on the AT-6, I put it in the SIM mode. And all the ordinance comes up as, as simulated. There's no ordinance there. I've just told the computer, you're in your training mode, and I can load whatever I want. I can reload it in flight, and I can have an infinite number of missiles, etc. Before you could do that, in the F-4, we had what were called SIM plugs, which were literally these little plugs that went into those cannon plugs that pretended to be a missile. They didn't even have a battery or anything. It's just a bunch of wires crossing so that when you put power on the missile station, that little SIM plug converted that power to a signal that went back into the airplane that said, you have an AIM-7F loaded. We had the same thing for the harm. And this is, you know, you put a harm SIM plug in your pylon, and now you pretend that the harm is loaded. So the ability to fool a primitive aircraft weapon system and let it know that it has a weapon on that it wasn't designed to hold, that's easy. And that was clearly done. And apparently it shows up as an R-27. What so I don't... Presumably then, sorry to interrupt you, but presumably then, so the things that you would usually expect from a simulated mode or maybe even from a, a sim plug, as you were describing, would be uh, a, a missile engagement zone or a weapons engagement zone, range data, um, time of flight, that kind of stuff. So presumably you won't get any of that if you just have a, a plug. Um, you will because all of that, your weapon engagement zone uh, is not generated by the missile. It is generated by the aircraft software. And so there's the, no, the MiG the MiG-29 might have that though, will it? I I don't know what a MiG-29 Wes looks like, but given the the design of the missiles, I'm fairly certain that they're technologically comparable to a late model AIM-7, and I'm almost entirely certain that the MiG-29s, even in its older A14 and A15 computers, uh, generated the weapon station or generated the Wes uh, independent of the weapon. Okay. Okay, and you want it that way so that you can fly training uh, without having to upload a weapon to fly a training sortie, which is is bad. And, and the relevance of the link to the AIM-7 is, uh, I think I'm right in saying this, you will tell me, I know, is that the harm is based on the AIM-7. Is it the rocket motor comes from the AIM-7? No, that what? was the, the Shrike was related, was closely oh, okay. related. Yeah, the harm is a completely new build uh, thanks to the U.S. Navy. Um, the other reason I give an AIM-7 example is because that's the easiest example of a SIM plug, uh, and that's comparable to the R-27 missile that the MiG would have had. So that's your first, how do you get a missile on that the airplane wasn't designed to carry and have it behave like a missile and behave like a weapon system? And step one is you fooled it, and it looks like the aircraft believes it's an R-27. Easy technological do, you know, it's just pins in, pins out, and voltages. The second thing you have to do is you have to hang the missile on the airplane because the AGM-88 is a rail-launched missile. And as you can see from the video, that missile moves at the speed of heat. It gets going fast, and it just keeps going until it's out of sight. Uh, and so that's uh, uh, you can see in one of the later shots in the video that the boosters are, are still burning, and they're going to be burning for a while as those two guys just head off to do their job. What I didn't know, and I still don't know, is I don't know whether the two-missile firing sequence is an artifact of the R-27 firing sequence or whether they're deliberately firing two missiles. I can go either way. Um, there are some aircraft like the, the, the Embraer A-29 is deliberately mechanized if you to only drop its weapons in pairs, one from each side, so that it doesn't have an asymmetric condition. Don't know whether the MiG-29 does that. Have no idea. Oh, some MiG-29 pilot. If you're out there, come on and you know hit the comments and tell us whether you can fire single R-27 missiles. And that'll clear that up. 
So we have a launch rail, and the 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 launch rail is called allow 118. Technically, allow 118 slash alpha. That slash, by the way, means something afterwards. A slash A after a piece of avionics equipment means it doesn't leave the airplane. A slash B means it does. Just think of slash B as meaning bomb. Uh, and slash A meaning aircraft, and you'll remember which stays where. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the LAO 118 is a launch rail, and it can be configured for either 14-inch lugs or 30-inch lugs. And that's just the spacing on the hooks that are on the aircraft pylon that hook in to hold that rail, that launch rail, on the airplane. So I have no idea what Russian spacing is, but that that's an easy engineering adapter, no electronics required, some sheet metal work. Uh, and, you know, crank it up with a, a socket wrench and you're good to go. So you've got your LAO 18. And a reminder that A7Es and A6s, old aircraft, fired harms. So you don't need the high-tech sensors uh, to feed data into it, although, you know, it makes everything better. In the back of the LAO 118 is what's called an ALIC. And here's where you bring up the ALIC picture. Or not, depending on how this works. There we go. Let's have a look. That's, oh. That's in full screen mode. There we go. All right. Okay, excellent. So this is its Spangdalum. It's relatively recently because it's in a uniform. That is Senior Airman Kasanas, who's pre preparing. He's got a, a, a harm missile uh, on the rail. And that boxy thing that's underneath the weapons pylon is allow 118 slash A with the ALIC. Uh, so you can see it's a launch rail. You can see where the harm in white clips onto the gray. And you can see how the rail itself mounts onto the pylon. And then you've got, you, you actually screw down these little, the, these little metal feet. Those are called sway braces to keep it from rocking side to side. Now on the right side of the photograph, the chunk of boxy metal with the triangles on it that seems to serve no purpose whatsoever, that's the ALIC. So this was designed for the F-4E and tested by the Air Force in the 80s for the F-16. And there's two ALICs, actually. There's one on the LAO 118, and there's another one that goes into a LAO 117 for shooting Maverick. And what they did, rather than have to do an expensive mod to the aircraft, the engineers said, we're going to add weapons to the F-16 by making the launch rail carry the extra computer and stuff. And it will be powered by aircraft power, just like the weapon is. And it will connect to the aircraft avionics system. So that box is the translator. It translates from the aircraft weapon system to the harm and then feeds harm data back. That is almost certainly how that the conversion was done. Because it does not need a very smart avionics interface to actually ignite the rocket motor again it's voltages so you can bring it down but that is pretty much the way that the harm is adapted is that the launcher has a computer on it uh and actually often when uh, when it, it used to be that sometimes the the missile was assembled with the alic and lao on it and then brought out to the aircraft and the whole assembly was brought up and then mounted on the pylon oh, really? um so I don't know if that's still common practice, and I don't know why it was done, you know, in the in the time frame that it was done. So now you don't have to have there's been some speculation in the press that there's a tablet or something that's communicating data. That's the Alix job. There doesn't need to be a tablet. What you would like is, but what you don't necessarily need, what you would like is you'd like a system in the cockpit that is going to hand data. Uh, based on what you do at the time. But the reality is, when you look at the Navy's techniques for preemptive shots in Desert Storm, they planned all that before they ever take off. And so even though you loaded the harm at the time of shooting, you could totally plan with the ALIC, you could plan the load that's going to go into that harm before the mission, um, You know, load up the ALIC, take off, and execute the mission and shoot the missile on time, on course. And you're good to go. You need no cockpit interface whatsoever. Do you have to have power on the aeroplane to, to to program the ALIC, or can that is it a sort of a persistent memory where if there's no power to it, it remains? 
Good so question. Do- I, the library, I mean, all the instructions, all the code in the ALIC is non-volatile. I think the handoff word would have to be built um, with and basically inserted with power on. But I can also think of ways that that could be bypassed. Um, in which case, you would not need power on. Uh, again, you might adjust the double EPROMs so that you have a fixed list. Um, it's going backwards in time. So when you loaded Shrikes in Vietnam, you had to actually pick the seeker. And so you would take off with like a dash three seeker on one wing and a dash four seeker on the other wing. And you had to write on the side. And then the EWO would write in the cockpit which one was which because you can't read the side of the missile from inside the airplane. Again, you can go back to that. But the bottom line is that when the harm leaves the rail, it has gotten its harm handoff word because if it doesn't get it, it won't fire. Can you can you put that into plain English then? Harm handoff word. What does that mean? That's the uh, name, address, and zip code of the radar or radars that you wish to target. So can in that in that case then one of the the questions that people have been asking is what sort of capabilities and what sort of modes and 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 what sort of operating model it, it might. Um, the Ukrainians might have available to them. Does that mean then that it's not necessarily the case that it goes out and they're saying here is a particular radar type in a particular location that this missile is going to go after? It's possible for them to be able to launch that missile and say if you see any of these types of radars, go after them. Uh, yeah, without going into any kind of details, uh, it is possible to, There's there's a wide programming range when you hand stuff off. It's uh, possible to you know, be very specific or possible to be very general. Um, it's not as general as a shrike. Okay? It's never as general as a shrike. A shrike was see something in the secret frequency band and you get it. Um, one of the reasons why we have always been confident in uh, the harm and the harm's ability to avoid unintended damage is even when it's loosened up, it's still looking for military radars. So it's not likely that it's going to go after a microwave tower or a, a mobile phone mast or something like that. Yeah, that's just flat out not going to happen. What, what do you think the likely, you know, having seen the video, you can see them ripple firing. Uh, the missile looks like it's going up into a loft trajectory, if that's the correct word. So they're obviously shooting at range um otherwise i suppose it would be going direct they wouldn't bother to, to try and loft itself but what do you think the the likely process is then for a ukrainian mig-29 pilot to shoot one of these things do you think there's an extensive back end in terms of intelligence gathering knowing do you think they're doing vol times do you think it's possible they're shooting stuff to cover somebody else doing something else or do you think it's more likely it's a much more simplistic um, implementation no, I think it's pre-planned. I think it's old-style Desert Storm Navy planning. Uh, know what radars uh, are operating in the area. Uh, plan what you would like to get and why. Uh, and what time you need to get it. Uh, I mean, battlefield attrition is great, but we're seeing more films now come out by the from the TB2. Uh, operations in Kherson is one that trickled out, two that trickled out, hitting a mortar position and hitting a, a armored fighting vehicle. So we also hear a lot of reports uh, from what limited OSINT is trickling out, says Ukrainian air is back in action in Kherson during the counteroffensive. Now, by and large, the Twitter feeds I rely on for OSINT information have gone quiet because when the counteroffensive kicked off on the night of the 28th, 29th, the Ukrainians sent out a message on social media, Twitter, every place else that said, hey, we want you guys to lock it down so we don't feed information to the Russians. And by and large, the community locks stuff down. Naturally, of course, the Internet abhors a vacuum, and that means that there's more cats on my OSINT feeds than there have ever been by an order of magnitude or more. Okay, just just help me out here because I've heard this expression. And I'm obviously an old fuddy-duddy because I don't know what it means. What is a cat? A cat? Yeah. It's a little furry feline animal that <laughs> insane people have in their houses. On your on your Twitter feed, you've got cats. Yeah, you're so, actually, so you're seeing more pictures. OSINT, OSINT Twitter feeds, you know, that are normally posting information and video clips and so on. They are posting images of cats. 
a lot of them are cats with Ukrainian soldiers. Um, you know, a, a Ukrainian soldier with his helmet full of cats. Uh, oh, so you, uh, you, you know, actually mean a, cats? I I, I, I mistook cats. that then. I, I thought that I thought that cats was sort of a there were there were sort of channels with cat in the name that relate to a certain type of Twitter user or something like that. But no, it's no, just I, yeah, cats. Fuck. Okay, I'm uh, yeah, yeah. going to edit that question out. <laughs> there was one. There was one uh, 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 video I saw, which unfortunately was before the counteroffensive. It was for Independence Day. Of a uh, a Ukrainian cat taking a power dump on a wrecked uh, <laughs> armored fighting vehicle that was on display in a city square somewhere. Ah, <laughs> uh, not the kind of thing I normally want to see on my Twitter feed, but nevertheless, it was there, and I clicked on it. I will confess. Um. So anyway, the uh, I suspect it's planned because they don't have an infinite number of rounds. Now, one of the things that that I kind of was trying to noodle through was why are they firing two? And my first thought was that's just the way the system is mechanized. And then I saw Russian claims that they were shooting down harms in flight. Mm -hmm. And so if the Russians are in fact shooting down harms in flight, or even if you believe them capable of shooting down harms in flight, which is tough, uh, then you might just fire two um, to make sure you get it. Yeah. There is another um, aspect that I, I, I'm fairly certain won't reveal anything, but it used to be, I always thought when I came into the F4G Wild Weasel, we targeted threat emitters with harms. You know, we were going to go after the radar. What... But I saw when I was a captain at Nellis, I saw an old film with a couple of weasel guys talking about, and this was during the transition between the F-105G and the F-4C and the F-4G, um, where guys were saying, yeah, with the new missiles, we want to target the acquisition radars because that denies the target trackers hmm. the ability to point and shoot. Uh, so I wonder if that's not going back and saying, oh, you know, we can target acquisition radars with this. That would have a huge advantage for the Ukrainians is that if the Russians are going to lose their acquisition radars, if they keep it up, then they may have to bring their radars down and start going to an MCOT mode, which makes their air situation picture much more fragmentary. That's why I'm confident about, you know, talking about this specifically on a podcast is so that I can say, and you're going to have to get ready with your bleep tone, and say to you Russian motherfuckers that if you leave your radars up, they're going to get killed. I want that message to get out there. If you leave your radars up, you're going to get killed. So if you want to live long enough to get back to Mother Russia, keep your radars off. That's defense suppression. Uh, so that's kind of what I've gleaned. The other thing I, I gleaned is I, I looked at the, the SPO-15, is the radar warning receiver in the MiG-29. It's not a great radar warning receiver design. Um, it's kind of basically a, you're being lit up, and if it's in the front quadrant, we'll give you a rough direction, and we'll tell you roughly what kind, but I can process like two threats. So it's kind of, it's a very binary radar warning receiver. Early Vietnam radar warning receivers were like that too. Um, in the harm shots there, those none of the threat indications are illuminated on the SPO-15. So whatever they're doing, they're not going deep into a threat wing to do it. Uh, and the lights, it's hard to tell, but there are lights on the bottom row um, of a SPO-15 that tell you what kind of radar. I think it goes um, airborne threat, medium range. No, airborne threat, long range, medium range. And in Russian, those would be like an inverted U and a C and an X, mm -hmm. uh, or a three and an X, I gather. I can actually, uh, I've, I've got that up in front of me if you want to, I can share that quickly. So this is the dash one from the German uh, MiG-29. Okay, so in the right that. there is the, uh, is the radar homing and warning display panel. There we go. And so um, the way a SPO-15 works is that that gray symbol that, that, is around the MiG-29 
21, that's actually red. And if that lights up, basically somebody, that's the engagement indication. The the primitive computer thinks you're being lit up. And that, that little semicircle in the middle of the airplane that's divided into two, that says if, if the top part, the front part lights up, the threat's above you. If the bottom part lights up, the threat's below you. And if both light up, it's at your level. That's how a SPO 15 works. If it's behind you, by the way, you get these two little triangles in the lower right or the lower left that say, dude, it's behind you. Good luck with that. Um, and then there are the rows along the bottom, which tell you your primary and your secondary threats. And so the the in, the staple there is an air threat. The uh, three next to it is... I think a long range acquisition. The X is a medium range acquisition. And I have no idea. I don't have enough brain cells left to tell you what H, F, or C mean, but I'm sure it's in the manual. Uh, so based on the films that the Ukrainian Air Force released, none of those red circles that would light up if you're actually being engaged by a, a airborne threat or a, another threat are lit. Um, it's pretty dead, and a couple of the lights along the bottom row are lit, but it's just, it's a little blurry, and I can't tell which ones. Mm -hmm. um, so it suggests to me that there are radars on the air when the harm is fired, which makes perfect sense. Uh, but I would not use a SPO-15 as my targeting sensor, and I'm not suggesting that they are. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned on, on our Discord channel, um, the uh, 10 Century Discord channel, which is always in the description of every video that I publish. So if anyone's interested in actually going and talking to Star Baby, who doesn't do social media, uh, particularly not Discord, then come along to our Discord channel. Uh, but you mentioned on there that there was never any tone or anything like that associated with launching uh, a harm. Um, what sort of is is it? Would there be any feedback? Do you think to a Ukrainian MiG twenty nine pilot that he was in the right place to shoot the missile? That the there were certain conditions met? Do you think it? You know, is he looking for a launch indication that, you know, you've already said it thinks it's an R-27. So, is, you know, is is the WES being calculated? It says to him, shoot now, and that's all he's got. Or do you think there's anything more substantial than that? No, I think he did all his launch planning on the ground. So he know, um, he's got a set of lat long coordinates. He's got a time. He's got an altitude. He's got an airspeed. He's got a heading. Um, and then he's just got to hit those criteria. Yep. So yeah. just like any other pre-planned weapons delivery. Um, I, I, I could think of ways to do a tone, but I can't think of a way to do a tone on a MiG-29. Uh, you know, I, I could think of it with modern avionics. Um, and it may be, who knows, maybe the Navy mechanized it that way and the Hornet gets a beep. All I know is that G models didn't get beeps. Mm. You, you talked about 1760, the data bus, uh, standard that, um, I, I guess allows a maximum amount of communication between the aeroplane and the weapon. And obviously the MiG-29 not having that. If it did have it, what would they really get from that? I mean, it's, it's a hypothetical. It's not, you know, should they be getting it? I'm not asking you that. I'm just saying what, yeah, else, sure. what else would it, what, what would it bring to the party? Okay, so the 1760 is just a fiber optic 1553B. So the mill standard is 1553B and it is a data bus that serves to allow all the independent bits of avionics on the airplane to share data. So, um, you know, when the radar needs to know what, what, where it is, right, it's getting that data from the INS GPS via the 1553 data bus. They're exchanging the data. Uh, well, some radars have their own inertial navigation systems in the radar. Uh, if you are typing up on the upfront controller, which is a separate piece of equipment from your radio, but you're changing your radio channel to do that, it is going through the 1553 data bus. And the 1760, like I said, the 1760 came about because there was so much data exchange required with uh, the new smart uh, GPS-aided weapons. And it's such a short time frame that uh, it wasn't, the copper wiring in the airplane wasn't enough. So you laid fiber to your weapon stations. And I don't know any more about it than uh, uh, than that. So what you could do with any, with a, it's a modern missile, what you could do is you could get feedback from the missile. Um, and sometimes it's just simple feedback, like, yes, I'm powered. Uh, like, And you probably do this in, in a variety of flight simulators. Do you ever get a, a weapons failure? 
Some in some flight sims you can get that, yeah. Yeah, yeah so yeah. it's because when you power up the weapon, you you normally the system will initiate a bit called a built-in test, which is to make sure that everything in that weapon is working right. That's a feedback loop. You yeah. know, if you get a fail indication on your on your packs, on your weapons panel, that's because you powered it up, the computer did a bit, the missile fed back and said, no, this component ain't working. Uh, that's the kind of exchange you can do with a 1553 and compatible weapons. And all NATO weapons um, really are capable of some kind of 1553B interface, except for really like the dumb bombs or even a laser guided bomb, but an enhanced laser guided bomb has an interface. Um, sometimes this is really simple. You know, there's a weapon on the station because there's a plunger depressed. And if the weapon had fallen off, the plunger would have extended. Yeah. Uh, that's a simple sensor. And that is also still in use. Can I ask you about generally the, your, your view on the release of this kind of video? We obviously, one of the things that you've brought to, uh, this channel, which I think everyone is just you know, really happy about is some weapon systems video that's been cleared by the Air Force and that doesn't contain anything sensitive. And frankly, it's old and it and it's you know not really it's not we're not talking about Amram shots or anything particularly sexy. Um, Arms are sexy. Sorry, uh, I, I misspoke. What I meant was uh, we're talking about sexy things. Twelves are sexy. Just keep that in mind. I need to reinforce the idea that you could be old and still sexy. You're you're much younger than I am. This is not important to you yet. It's important to us old guys. But what do you what do you think about the release of this video? Just from a sort of an opsec. Um, yeah, you know, we're having this conversation, and and there's a there's a likelihood some Russians are going to come and watch this. Um, you know, other people have done reaction videos to this. There's a likelihood that their videos are going to get watched. So there's there's focus and discussion. I mean, there's nothing in there that shows the range, as far as I can tell, that they're shooting at or what they're shooting at. So it's not, you know, they're not releasing really any secrets. But what about does that is that a so is there a dichotomy between that and them releasing a message to the wider community saying go into lockdown and don't share information about what you're seeing out of your windows in Kherson or anywhere else in Ukraine? Let us get on with our job. No, because if I thought that they're totally different, and I'll explain why, if I thought that that Russians could get any kind of OSINT information out of this, I, I wouldn't have agreed to do it. The key is that when we talk about defense suppression, we tend to talk about aircraft, sensors, and weapons. And that is superficial. Effective defense suppression happens in the mind of the air defender. I just want the audience to know that it's clear that I've driven Steve to drink because that looked like a wine glass. <laughs> it is, yeah. It was full to begin with. It's almost okay. Empty <laughs> so, so I think it was a great idea to release it, um, and to show, hey, yeah, we're definitely shooting harms and we're shooting them at you. And I think it's a great idea to talk about it because I want to reiterate to Russian air defenders that your best chance of living in to collect that pension payment that you're not going to get is to keep your radar off, you bastards. <laughs> what What about then? You mentioned it, and there was some skepticism in your voice, and I didn't follow up, but you mentioned the idea of them shooting down uh, AGM-88s in flight, and you're saying that's quite a tricky thing to do. I live in a world where... I play lots of flight sims, and in the flight sims I play, there are air defense systems where that capability is modeled. I'm assuming that there's been some research done, you know, that, that it's not completely in the land of, you know, sort of gaga to say that uh, a modern uh, surface to air missile system could could see, find fixed target, engage a uh, an AGM-88 in flight. Do you have a different view? Not really. The Russians started claiming that they could engage any radiation missiles in the 90s. It became an air show thing. Uh, certainly, if you were firing a, a harm equivalent weapon at a U.S. Navy Aegis cruiser, I think that it, the the weapon would get eaten for lunch. That's what Aegis is for. Um, so, well, uh, and in fact, you know, live missiles, at least without live warheads, have been shot at Aegis ships, you know, so that we can demonstrate that. That's not all done in simulation. 
Uh, that's what actually sold the Aegis system when the Ticonderoga was built. There was a lot of question over whether or not it was work. work. And what I read of the test report is that 12 missiles were shot at the Tico during her sea trials, you know, all programmed to miss. And she bagged 11 out of 12. And the reason she didn't bag the 12th is because it had a malfunction and dropped into the water. Oh, that's amazing. Okay, so this is this is block one, first ship of the class. Okay, now the Aegis system is much better. So having said that, harms are freaking fast. And so you might not be able to track one because your Doppler filters don't allow you to track a missile that fast. I've seen that happen on radar coding. Um Doppler uh, filters could have a, a limit for 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 too fast. I always thought sort of Doppler filters were there just to sort of weed out the slow stuff. Let's say uh, they are, but you can also put and I've seen on radars in software a high end, and I don't remember the reason for it. Uh, it's probably to reduce some kind of uh, interference or false target, but you can you can reject things wow. uh, that are too fast because you might not believe them. Um, it may be an anti-jamming technique. That kind of detail, unfortunately, I don't know. Um, so the other thing is, is your missile fusing. Uh, in that your fuse may function too late against a very high speed target. Uh, or you may not have the right angle. That's one of those challenges with, with weapons fusing is... If that fuse functions a teeny tiny bit too late, too late is too late. All the missile fragments and the warheads go behind your target. Your target sails on by unaware and unconcerned. Uh, so Russian claims notwithstanding, it's not out of the question that a harm could be intercepted. Uh, but the best bet for an air defender is to shut your freaking radar down and go home. Uh, we'll, and, keep we'll, we'll keep repeating that message until we finish. <laughs> um, yeah, when I, <laughs> there we go. Uh, to, so, to, go. No, I interrupted you. I interrupted you. Finish your train of thought. Um, yeah, so there is a possibility with an advanced weapon system that you can stand and defend where you keep all your radars up, I'd have to want to be pretty darn confident that would work. And I'm not sure the Russians have the testing or training regiment to instill that confidence in your air defense operators. I think, I mean, as we said right at the beginning, we're going to do a, a separate session with you, uh, which will be the live stream in, in sort of eight or so days' time where we talk about you, the Ukrainian uh, campaign, air, air defense, and and so on from, from your point of view, your thoughts on it. Um, so we're sort of, don't want to venture too far into that territory. But one thing I read recently was that they have, uh, the Russians have asked Syria but for an S-300, uh, SA-10, I think that is, uh, surface to air missile system back that they have given them, um, which would suggest that they actually have, uh, notwithstanding whatever operational ambitions they have, they don't have necessarily the numbers in order to to really sort of sustain a long standing campaign. Um, but do you think that um, that's a likely approach for the from the Russian point of view? Do you think it's likely that they'll try and adopt that or? Uh, because one of the the things that is a, that seems to be apparent, and you will perhaps sort of um, you know, uh, provide a, a view on this when we actually have our session in eight days is that there's a lot of overestimation of Russian capability and Russian ability. Uh, so I wonder whether, you know, they, they are, are they able to go and use sneaky sort of the sort of sneaky tactics that the North Vietnamese guys 40 years ago or so figured out and did, uh, you know, are they, are they that clever or are they just going to take the brute force method and, and suffer the consequences? They are that clever. I mean, they're, the Russians are clearly capable of adapting uh, and, you know, survivors will adapt. Right. So the dumb guys are the ones that get killed. Uh, but there's the a lot of them getting killed, though, which would suggest there's quite a few of them who are dumb. Well, in terms of air defenders, um, you know, we don't really know what uh, what the outcomes are. The S-300 is true. And in fact, the British Ministry of Defense reported that the ship loading it came through the Bosporus and Ukraine issued a to march to the Turks saying that the ship carrying the S-300s met the definition 
on the convention of a warship and should not have been allowed to pass the Dardanelles. Uh, so that definitely happened. But that's not... A, I mean, if you're desperate enough that you need to reinforce Crimea, and that's what they're doing by bringing back your air defense system from Syria, that means you're spread kind of thin. And what's your maintenance situation like? So I've learned over the years that if the Russians claim something for an air defense system on an air show brochure, I will take it at face value. But I have also learned over the years that Russian systems are not maintained to their fully operational factory fresh standard and that their the the quality of the systems that they use for testing so they can make their claims may not reflect a production quality system. In your experience, is that was that a, is that different in the West? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, the the test systems, your, your production systems are often better than your test systems because we actually have quality control, and we don't have people stealing the parts to sell uh, on the black market. Um, now we do have our problems with, with counterfeit parts, and you know people who don't weld their submarines correctly, and guys who sell their night vision goggles on youtube you you know who you are uh there's still some degree of pilferage but the the western weapons procurement system writ large does not have uh the kind of problems that the russian military industrial complex does in terms of pilferage and theft uh you know plus they have to steal all their electronics in the united states um so that's another uh possible quality control or difficulty in getting your your quality before you ever heard of a speak and spell no. the speak and spell was a toy from the 70s it was a little it it, it was a maybe 80s it was a very simple chip in which uh a kid could type one of the pre-selected uh pictures you know icons on a keyboard like the cat button or the dog button and the machine would speak and spell it for them as a this was more advanced than anything the Soviets could produce, so they stole them by the jillions. They just bought them or stole them and shipped them to, to repurpose the chips in some industrial control applications. And long ago declassified, the CIA ran an op where they basically contaminated the speak and spell chips that were going to the Russians. Uh, there's speculation that the, the world's largest natural gas explosion, which happened in Russia in the 80s, was caused by... CIA contaminated uh, speak and spell chips. Wow. That's never been confirmed or denied, of course, because the agency doesn't do that. Uh, but nevertheless, um, that is the, the, the long running. You have to steal Western stuff to get your Russian stuff to work. It's not that they can't engineer it with homegrown. It's they don't have the industrial capacity to build production runs on a large scale with homegrown microelectronics. So, so last question then, before we wrap up, and, and I give the floor to you to say whatever you want in conclusion. But on that note, and touching on something you, meant, you mentioned right at the beginning around exploitation by the Russians of any components that might survive. And it's kind of interesting to see some pictures on Twitter of people claiming um, there were some dud harms and you, you pointing out it's the rocket motor. It's the bit behind the warhead. Uh, tends not to get blown up um but but it, but it, it it is i suppose possible and of course the u.s will have done a, a risk assessment on the possibility that you know something will dud or some the russians could get hold of something and figure out something about the missile but from your point of view you know if the worst came to the worst and, and, a, and a, a harm fell into a soft field somewhere and the russians got their hands on it what sort of things uh, and again you're not going to talk specifics but what sort of things could they learn about that missile and what would it mean to Ukraine's ability to employ it in the future effectively or even to the general security of the harm program for other nations? It would mean Jack because we know that Block 2 harms soft landed in Iraq in 1991 and were sent to the Russians. There is nothing hardware wise about that version of the missile that they have not been able to exploit. I mean, they're talented engineers. Uh, you know, I don't know what software load and, you know, how would you tell? Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, the old stuff is long. It's been in their hands forever. What they need to know about the harm, uh, they've already gotten out of it. And you don't see that they, they have manufactured a claim to have manufactured 
a reverse engineered harm or a harm ski. It's still a KH-31. Mm -hmm. You wrap up for us then, Starby. Any any concluding thoughts on the video on, or on the um, Ukrainian employment of the of the harm before we before we finish for today? Yeah, I think the Ukrainian employment uh, is probably very smartly done. They've given it some thought. Uh, it's part of a campaign. They're not just throwing harms out of there. Uh, I think they learn fast, and it's really a tribute to the engineering and support guys who figured out a way to put that together. Uh, and get a what is really still a modern uh, U.S. weapon on a real, somewhat less than modern uh, Soviet era aircraft without any Western uh, weapon system in there. So I think it's a tribute to smart people doing smart things. I'm thrilled that the U.S. is supplying them. I hope they have an effect on the battlefield. And if you're Russian, I think your best plan is to shut your radars off and go home. Or you can leave your radars on and go home. The key part of that sentence is really go home. Thanks for tuning in to 10% True. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to subscribe. And if you're on YouTube, hit the bell button to make sure you get notified of the next episode. Thanks and take care.